with each other. Do you think that using the phrase Chinese virus um, is... I think what the president was saying is that's where it started. I'm, I'm married to an Asian. This is why you have a virus. I'm so sorry, but I think that was a very racist comment. Yeah? Yeah. Wow, great. What did say? I said you dropped your coronavirus. The, a person at the White House used the term the Kung thing. Flu. My question is, do Kung you think flu. that's wrong, Kung Flu? And do you think using the term Chinese virus that puts Asian Americans at risk, that people no, might target them? No, 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 no. I think they probably uh, would agree with it 100%. I'm Eddie Conway coming to you from Baltimore uh, for the real news. Um, there's a lot in the news about COVID-19 uh, and there's very little discussion about how this is impacting uh, different races and class. Uh, so joining me today to kind of give us an overview of what's going on in that environment is Dylan Rodriguez, professor at Riverside University. Uh, so Dylan, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me as always, Eddie. Dylan, can you give us an overview of what the, the, the racist environment around this uh, pandemic looks like? There's so many different layers to understanding how it is that the pandemic is uh, on the one hand demonstrating all the embedded systemic institutional and ideological forms of racism that have always been present since really the foundations of the United States in its modern form. Um, the pandemic has not, it's important for everybody to understand, the pandemic has not introduced anything new in terms of uh, racist ideology, racist rhetoric, uh, and, and, and racist state mobilizations. Nothing is new. What, what's happened is that the pandemic has helped on the one hand in a very immediate sense, to demystify the historical persistence of very specific forms of anti-Asian, specifically anti-Chinese racism and xenophobia, uh, that I think until this moment, most political pundits, even academics, public intellectuals, and, and some journalists would, would likely characterize as artifacts, past tense, you know, uh, uh, artifacts of the 19th century, of World War II, maybe the Korean War, maybe the Vietnam War. So, so in thinking about the, these particular forms of anti-Asian racism that, of course, the White House is amplifying on a daily basis um, through, through press conferences, through Twitter and everything else, what we, I think, have to understand is that these particular forms of racism are actually constitutive. They are, they are, they are foundational um, to everyday normalized white supremacist thought, racist thought and culture in the U.S., including and especially in the halls of the federal government and the White House. So, so that's, that's one thing. Um, I think, I think what is critically important, and, and uh, my, my good friend and colleague, Connie Wan, uh, the founder of AAPI Women Lead, is one of the leading people thinking about this, is that, is that these particular forms of anti-Asian racism that are being amplified in this moment are inseparable from the longstanding foundational paradigmatic forms of state violence and racist violence against people on the border, and especially against poor, marginalized, and vulnerable Black folks. Um, so if we think about anti-Asian anti racism as inseparable from different forms of anti-Blackness and different forms of colonial violence, then we, we, we have something that we have to analyze far more deeply than just the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and, and I think that one way to understand how this works, how this interconnectedness works, is to look at the, what is becoming exposed at this point through the pandemic as the genocidal logic of the incarcerating racist state, the carceral racist state. What we have to understand is that the pandemic shows this is not a mass incarceration state. This is a state that targets people. It is a form of low intensity, normalized domestic war that targets very specific populations, poor populations, black populations, in particular geographies, brown, indigenous, and undocumented populations for incarceration. And, and the pandemic is subjecting these folks to mass vulnerability to a contagion that nobody understands, right? The scientific community is struggling to understand this thing, struggling to understand what mortality and vulnerability and long-lasting effects to your respiratory system uh, are like. 
and, and, and the folks who are essentially being used as if they are um, test rats for this are people who are locked up. And keep in mind, everybody listening to this, that, that the vast majority of the people who are locked up in jails, who are being exposed to this pandemic, that, to this contagion we don't understand, are folks who are awaiting trial. So even, even the right-wingers that are watching this, or even the liberals that are watching this, that think that locked up people deserve what they get because they've been convicted of a crime, you need to, you need to make, make, uh, 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 do away with, with, with that way of thinking in, 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 in just understanding that this is, about, this is about thinking through how it is that people who are allegedly presumed innocent right, are locked up in jail because they can't afford bail, they can't afford defense, and are systemically subjected to this kind of thing. That is not that is not mass incarceration at that point, right? What you're talking about is a very specific set of populations that are essentially being used as as test rats uh, for, for figuring this thing out. There's a lot more to say about how it is that racism is working right now, but I think the interconnectedness between these different forms of, of, of racial violence, um, between anti-Blackness, between longstanding forms of colonial violence, and then this very particular kind of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese racism need to be connected all the time, especially by people who are organizing around, around things like social justice, anti-racism, community, different forms of community empowerment, carceral and prison abolition, and so forth. Okay, uh, you know, it's an interesting point because uh, we had been looking at uh, the trickle out of prisoners uh, in different states right now, uh, 50 here, 100 there, 200 there. We're talking about a population of somewhere between two and a half to three million people. Uh, is that silence and that lack of kind of attention and focus, is that about the 75% of the prison population is people of color? Is, is, is that what we are seeing? I, I think that's a central part of this. Um, I mean, I think more specifically, it's the fact that more than half of the incarcerated population is black. As we know in the long history of the modern United States, the most, this, arguably, the most disposable populations in the United States have been native people whose lands are being occupied and who are being displaced from you know, their ecosystems, their economies, and black folks, right, who are especially those who are descendants of the chattel system. So, so if we understand this continuity that abolitionists, carceral abolitionists, prison abolitionists, organizers, thinkers, activists, students, scholars, formerly incarcerated people have been talking about for at least intensively, at least the last 20 to 25 years, which is that there is a direct continuity between the racial chattel slave system and the modern system of incarceration in the United States, then we can, we can actually make sense of what you're talking about, Eddie, which is that, that to the extent that this incarcerating system is, is a direct derivative of the chattel plantation system, the folks who are locked up, particularly because they're they are more than half, they're majority black, are not seen to be a population that is worthy of, of mobilization for protection, right? That they're essentially, in this sense, not only disposable, um, but ignorable. Yes, one of, one of the things that, that uh, came to my attention is, uh, the way in which Asian countries are actually dealing with this pandemic, uh, it seems that uh, the surveillance systems, which we know is all over the United States and Western nations also, has been used to monitor the temperature of individuals as they come in and out of the country, as they uh, uh, travel through the country on trains, uh, bus stations, et cetera. And that has allowed them to gain control over the moving population in terms of who's spreading uh, this pandemic. Uh, and that's then kept their numbers down. I mean, in, in uh, South Korea is a good example. Uh, in uh, the surround Vietnam, the surrounding countries all around China is good examples. Uh, but yet they have cameras in all the prisons and everywhere in the Western countries and in uh, the United States in particular, but they're not using this technology to uh, monitor the temperatures of individuals and, and uh, uh, select them for tests. Uh, why do you think that is? Well, this is a critical point, Eddie, because surveillance is at this point global, particularly in overdeveloped so-called first world or global north you know, countries and societies. What, what you just pointed out is how it is that surveillance systems are not objective. 
they are structured in an ideological position of some kind. Uh, in particular places, it might be a state which is particularly authoritarian that wants to have direct control and surveillance over its population to do things like monitoring the spread of a pandemic, uh, monitoring people's movements and so forth. Um, in, in places like the United States, the surveillance is not structured through an ethic of caring for the population. That's what we are seeing here. The surveillance apparatus, the surveillance regime in the United States, the public, meaning the state-run surveillance apparatus, and private uh, or, or, or kind of ordinary citizen or corporation or business-run surveillance apparatuses, they're not in place to take care of people. They're there to essentially to protect capital, to protect wealth, and to socially control and criminalize people. So nothing in the surveillance apparatus that is in place, from the technology to the administration of it, is actually structured to, um, to, to, to be mobilized uh, uh, to protect people from the spread of pandemic. None of it, none of the stuff that's in place does that, right? Your ring doorbell doesn't do that. I mean, I'm just thinking about the most mundane forms of people's surveillance in their homes, right? That's not what does that. The uh, surveillance systems in businesses and on, uh, you know, on street corners, those things are not there to do that. What they're there to do is, is really to control the movement of people um, uh, for the protection of wealth, for protection of capital, and for protection of state interests. It's not there for, for things like a collective protection of the population from spread of disease or, 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 even, for, or even for protection against uh, times, of, times of natural disaster and so forth. That's not what it's for. So, so it demystifies this. It tells us that the technology that we're, that we're inhabiting and that we're negotiating every day, it can't magically be turned into something which is, 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 mo is, is uh, uh, utilized through an ethic of caring for people. That's not what this is. Okay, and you know, I, I would even go a step further and look at the, uh, this um, relief package that has just been delivered uh, or, or passed through uh, the Senate. $1,200. Uh, that's the, to me, that seems like the people that have money and the people that are, are getting bailouts in terms of uh, multinational corporations are going to be okay. But down on the ground, where we're talking about a vulnerable population that's living from paycheck to paycheck, uh, from rent to rent, uh, and in too many cases not able to go to work, at, at this point, uh, what does that package say from the government? What it tells us once again is, is, that, is that the state does not have an infrastructure of care. The state, the state is not that. In the U.S., the state is not organized around creating, sustaining, much less expanding infrastructures of care for the people that it supposedly serves in times of, of radical and unknowable vulnerability like the current moment. This, this is an, an, you know, an alarming thing, but it's also something that I think grassroots radical movements, um, even progressive movements have been saying this for many, 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 many years, right? Which is that you cannot simply rely on a racist, uh, neoliberal, you know, corporate protecting, wealth protecting colonial state to suddenly magically serve you in a time of disaster. So what you're seeing with the bailout package is exactly what you just described, Eddie. It's the state revealing what it is that is animated by it. And this is across the proverbial aisle. This is not a Republican or Democrat thing. Both, the, both parties are structured in the, same, in the same ethic, which is to say that its infrastructure is poised to protect wealth, corporate capital, the ideological principles of white nationalism, of anti-blackness, of 21st century versions of colonial power, and of populist white supremacy. That's, that's what this bailout package directly reflects. Um, you know, folks will talk about $2 trillion. The, the overwhelming majority of, of that uh, majority of that money is going to go in, essentially into the hands of corporate CEOs, right? People who actually have control of concentrated wealth, uh, and it's there to protect their interests. It's not, it's not there to, you know, try to, try to uh, uh, flatten curves or to bring in more ventilators or to expand hospital beds for folks who are inevitably going to be, you know, needing intensive, intensive critical care. Okay. Let, uh, let's just look at another angle of this. Is there lessons that we can learn from this? I mean, people are, are working from home. They're uh, uh, basically working with uh, uh, technology. Um, uh, they're getting their jobs done. Our news network is operational. Uh, 
And I understand that it's predicted that millions of jobs will probably be lost, won't come back. Uh, but is this something that uh, progressive people or leftist people in America can learn in terms of a new way of operating uh, and uh, delivering services and supplying goods and uh, taking care of each other without being uh, forced into that uh, factory environment? This is, this is the question, Eddie, as far, as far as folks that are probably likely to be watching this interview and, 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 and logging into Real News Network are concerned. That is the question. I, I would say this is absolutely a moment in which uh, folks that are involved in anything from traditional, traditional grassroots movements, meaning movements that have organizations that are you know, structured and fueled by organizations, people involved with 501c3 grassroots um, and foundation funded organizations, to ordinary people who are not necessarily involved in a traditional social movement, but are part of a network or community of people that, that, that is trying to do their best to survive the current moment while also being attentive to the need for systemic and structural change so we can get past um, not just the, the COVID-19 pandemic, but get past everything from the Trump administration. For that matter, we had to get past the Obama administration. Right. So, so for all people who are in any way engaged in struggle, right, not just social movements, but struggle, struggle to try to make or initiate systemic change within their lifetime. Um, what this moment amplifies, the lesson to be learned is that folks need to organize constantly around and through an ethic of collective care and survival. I'll repeat that one more time. We, we, meaning all the folks that are interested in systemic changes that are that are there to uh, create radical forms of justice, right? Radical forms of survival and and um, thriving, you know, of, especially for the people who are most vulnerable to suffer. We need to organize around and through an ethic of collective care and survival. This is very different, I would argue, than organizing for specific policy aims. Right. It's very different than organizing around demands on the state or specific institutions like hospitals, schools, universities, local state government or the courts. Right. It's to think about collective care and survival as a method of organizing. This is how we shape this. Is, this is this. This ethic is what should shape the way that we articulate our radical analysis of our conditions. It should shape our rhetorics. I say this because something I think we've we should have already learned by now is that it's really hard to build. Uh, socially transformative, radical, progressive movements through strictly rational analysis, right? That addresses the bullshit that you hear on Fox News, right? Or corrects the constant lies flowing from different politicians. Trump's, the, tr 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 Trump's at the top of the pyramid, but it's happening all the time. It's happening all the time. To the extent that movements are constantly in the position of being hyper-rational, trying to correct untruth with truth, but, but are not organizing through a method of caring, Right. Um, um, we're, they're, they're not going to gain traction. So movements, I think, need to learn the lesson right now, right here, because we're pushed into position right now and right here that the ethic of collective care is really a matter of survival. This is this. Is, and, and so we need to let that ethic, the thing we're in now, mutual aid, people involved in all forms of mutual aid right now. Right. Like I've been logging on, you know, sending whatever funds I can to all different forms of mutual aid. Right. For incarcerated people, people just getting out. Um, folks that are trying to serve the unhoused population, um, people with food insecurity, all this kind of stuff, right? What we need to, what we need to remember once, once the pandemic, once COVID-19 passes, right, is that the ethic of survival, mutual aid, collective care, that has to be a constant. That has to be a methodological imperative in all the organizing we do. I mean, meaning that the language of collective care has to be part of our analysis, our critique. And I'll put a special point on this. It's, it has to be part of our own internal struggles, right? What, 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 is, what is particularly difficult about, about being part of different movements, organizations, you know, collectives that are, that are engaged in left-oriented, socially transformative struggle is that our internal struggles, we don't have the luxury generally of falling back on a multi-million dollar foundation to constantly fund us, right? And to allow us to resolve our conflicts in a way that will um, still sustain our movements. Oftentimes, our internal conflicts are so antagonistic and so severe that movements and organizations and organizing actually just falls apart, right? And so there's something to be said about how this moment um, sheds, sheds a, a kind of broader perspective that puts that stuff into relation to the struggle for survival 
I think we got to figure out a way to engage in robust antagon, you know, even antagonistic and, and, and intense debate in terms of internal struggle within different movements and organizing, uh, organizing collectives, um, while also keeping an eye to the need for collective care. Right, that you can have a, a, a hyper severe antagonism with somebody else that's involved in your collective, a severe political disagreement with them, but still care, right? But still care and still and still and still try to figure out ways that you can struggle with and alongside them through an ethic of care, e even, even, as you, even as you struggle to resolve or deal with your political conflicts, right? This, this moment, I think, has, has forced a lot of us into that position where folks that we might not have been speaking with, right? We might not be, have been on speaking terms with them. I have a bunch of people that have been emailing me, texting me, whatnot, you know, who I've had many conflicts with in the past, right? right? Um, uh, but, but we're folks reaching out to each other, right? Say, hey, you all right? Just checking in just checking in man like that's sometimes that's the gesture you need check in man and like and, and 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 that's what that's what i think the political discourse of the movements and the political collective that you're talking about eddie that's something that we need to we need to take this as an opportunity to really build or rebuild on that right it's, it's a sense of community but not in the romantic sense right it's a sense of community in the sense that it's it's, it's struggle it's internal struggle too but you've got to care you got to have an ethic of care okay um just one, one. Do you have a final statement or anything you'd like to share? Uh, that was that was very powerful. Uh, but do you have any final words for our audience? Absolutely. Uh, you know, we we have to all be radical organizers now, right? If if we understand that all we mean by radical is that we are dealing with systemic problems, we're dealing with the roots of systemic and institutional violence. Of, of, of asymmetrical suffering. We all need to be radical now. We need to deal with the foundations of that stuff. We need to uh, uh, collectively accept and, and deal with a, a definitive premise that's long been accepted by radical and revolutionary movements around the world for, for many years, which is the fact that the, the US state in particular and corporate capitalism in particular are the source of the problem. They're not the solution to the problem, right? Um, that demands on the state cannot presume that its accountabilities are somehow going to shift to serve the vast majority, much less the most vulnerable people in this population. Um, I'll also tell people, please, um, even as, especially if you're quarantined, build on, in addition to a, a, a the ethic of care, build on the ethic of self-defense, right? We need to take seriously all the, all the layered and nuanced and complex forms of self-defense. I'm not necessarily telling you to go out and buy a gun, although I'm not against that. Right. But I am saying we need to have a collective sense of self-defense, um, it, it, you know, whether it's martial arts, but really in the broader sense. Right. That we need to be defensive of each other. That's part of the ethic of care. Right. It, it is a proactive ethic. It means we need to proactively and aggressively defend each other and ourselves. We need to build those skills. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll encourage is we need to be as creative as possible in our forms of community building and community sustenance. Uh, we need to accompany mutual aid, which is. It, it, it's, it, it runs the risk of slipping into philanthropy, right, of charity. That's not what we need. What we need is mutual aid accompanied by mutual accountability, right, uh, uh, in the sense of even at a small scale, a, a minor, a modest redistribution of our wealth within our community, within these communities that we build, right? Because um, you're right, Eddie, that $1,200 check, that's not going to go that far. For most folks, that's not even half of, that's not even half of their rent on, on, on a one-bedroom apartment. Um, so, well, some... Some some notion or some ethic of wealth redistribution at a mod, even at a modest scale is necessary now, although it needs to happen at, at, at a much larger scale. Um, I'll also say pay attention to all the different, um, you know, radical progressive organizations right now that are embracing the creative opportunity to organize differently. Uh, I'm thinking about my my good friend and and, and comrade Rachel Herzing at the uh, Center for Political Education just sent an email this morning with a bunch of of um, internet accessible or smartphone accessible resources for folks, everything from music. A playlist to to, uh, to films that are free to download, um, you know, to to books that you can access online, podcasts and whatnot. I mean, this is an ample opportunity to self-educate, to embrace the opportunity uh, to build reading communities, listening communities. Um, but but we got to do that with care. We got to do that with a principled uh, commitment to radical change. Uh, otherwise, otherwise this this shit's gonna happen. Right, right it's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen again. It's gonna happen over and over, and there won't be any of us left to talk about it. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining me, Professor Rodriguez, and uh, hopefully we'll have some more discussion around this issue in the near future. Looking good, Eddie. <laughs> okay. All right. And thank you for joining me at The Real News.
Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.